The results are in for many primary races held in five states yesterday, and it was a big night for candidates backed by former President Donald Trump. Trump-backed candidate Blake Masters won the Senate Republican primary in Arizona. He will now go up against incumbent Democratic Senator Mark Kelly in November. Also in Arizona, Mark Fincham won the Republican primary for secretary of state. He has repeated false claims about the 2020 election and was backed by former President Trump. And in the Missouri Republican Senate primary, the state's attorney general, Eric Schmidt, beat out former governor Eric Greitens. The former president caused a bit of confusion on Monday after he endorsed, quote, Eric without specifying which candidate he was endorsing. Mr. Trump did call Schmidt to congratulate him on Tuesday. For more on all of this and the Eric's, Chuck Rocha and Emily Jasinski joined us now. Chuck is the president of Solidarity Strategies, and Emily is the culture editor for The Federalist and a senior fellow at the Independent Women's Forum. Great to have you both with us uh, this evening. We appreciate your time. Chuck, we'll begin with you. Arizona Senate race now could be one of the more competitive contests this year. How do you see Senator Mark Kelly's race with Republican Blake Masters? Well, normally in Arizona, in an off-year election, and for all of you at home, uh, off-year election is when the president's not on the ballot. And in these red states like Arizona and Georgia, it's normally tougher for a Democrat to win in an off-year election. But the Republicans have handed the Democrats lots of free gifts with some of the nominees that are backed by Trump that have been nominated in these states. You couple that with strong Democratic incumbents who've had strong fundraising, who have millions of dollars, who have already been advertising. Mark Kelly and his supported super PACs and the party apparatus have been advertising in English and most importantly in Spanish now for over four months. And I think this is going to make Arizona a real pivotal state when you look at it differently than you normally do in a regular off-year election. You've worked, Chuck, with uh, Latino voters for years. I remember covering you when you were working with Senator Bernie Sanders. How is that vote going to play out in Arizona? Uh, we have seen some trends across the country in various polls that it is moving to the right in some parts of this country. It's interesting that you bring that up, Bob. And, and, and in Arizona, it hasn't moved to the right like it has in other states. In Arizona and in California, you haven't seen the drift to the right with Latino voters. But to your point, it's the most critical piece of this election. I go back to my original point. Those drop-off voters, guess who the majority of them are? Latino voters. The average age of a Latino voter in the U.S. is just 27. So they underperform more so black voters or white voters in an off-year election. So the key to Mark Kelly's success are these Latino voters who normally only participate every four years when the president's on the ballot. I think that's why you've seen the real intentionality of his campaign doing lots of Spanish language advertising and organizing on the ground in the Latino community. Emily, what's your take on Missouri's Senate race? The, the former Missouri governor, Eric Greitens, was unable to overcome scandals from his past in his bid for the Senate. Uh, the former president, as we've discussed and the media has discussed at length, endorsed Eric. Uh, what does Eric Schmidt, the attorney general's race, now look like in the general election? Well, and, and Arizona is almost either a complement or a foil to what we saw happen in Missouri, because on the one hand, in Arizona, as Chuck said, it's become a really interesting test case for how some narratives might play out uh, in general elections in the midterm and then also in primaries in 2024. Um, and what you see there with Carrie Lake or in the race we're just talking about with Blake Masters, you have some candidates that are, I guess, more uh, persuasive embodiments of the post-Trump Republican Party or the post-post-2016 Republican Party, and you almost see that as well in Missouri in the race between the Eric's, between Greitens and Schmidt. Greitens tried really hard to out MAGA everyone. Um, and in a lot of ways, you can look at Greitens as a very Trumpian candidate. But with him now losing, which was uh, terrified a lot of Republicans here in Washington, D.C., um, you, you see a lane opening up for someone who could try at least to be an embodiment of the post-2016 Republican Party without what a lot of people see as the baggage um, that comes with uh, some of the candidates in Arizona are a really good example of that. What do you make, Emily, of when you see uh, 
what happened in Kansas? And when you're talking to sources on the conservative side of the Republican Party, does this make them sit up a little bit and say they need to rethink their whole midterm strategy or not? There's such a pronounced divide in the GOP over whether this issue is a, a political harm or a political advantage. And certainly it depends on the state and it depends on the region. The pro-life uh, movement of part of the conservative movement is convinced that this is politically expedient to campaign on a strong pro-life ticket is something that helps Republicans. Kansas is something that gave the more establishment Republicans, maybe some folks over at the RNC, the opportunity to hold something up and say, listen, we are not going back to the 2012 war on women narrative because it is toxic in purple states and even in red states like Kansas. Now, Kansas is kind of an interesting state, but generally a red state. Um, and so this gave a lot of uh, sort of ideological ammunition uh, to that establishment wing. And there has been that tug of war playing out in the Republican Party itself, behind closed doors um, in Washington, D.C., and on campaigns around the country. How is this issue going to play out? Kansas is, is a big talking point for the people who think that it's it's going to lead to another war on women 2012 uh, sort of redux. And, and what about uh, your take, Chuck, on what's happening with abortion and how it's going to affect Democrats? The biggest problem that Democrats have in an off-year election is motivation, is excitement. And up until the decision by the Supreme Court, me and you and lots of us who've been talking about this on TV have talked about the lack of enthusiasm in the party. Joe Biden's numbers are low. Uh, the Senate and the House numbers are higher than him or overperforming him by 10 points. We passed all this legislation to change all these peace lives to all these people's lives for the better, but couldn't get any traction on motivating our party and those drop off again midterm voters. This gives us an example and something to focus on that does energize, especially women in our party, especially sometimes, to Emily's point, moderate Republican women in certain states. And it gives us a lot of ammunition to run against Republicans on a very divisive issue. Early on with this issue, I was saying that if, the, if you really cared about this issue, you had picked a team, team red or team blue. But last night in Kansas proved me wrong that there is a whole nother level of energy out there that Democrats need in a midterm election if we have any hopes of retaining the House or the Senate for our party's majority. Emily, finally here, there's one other variable I'm tracking, which is the possible entry of former President Trump into the 2024 presidential race before November's elections. Are you hearing anything new on that? And if he got in, what do you believe the Republican response would be? Yeah, it's such an interesting question because I do expect him to announce. Honestly, I expect him to announce in the fall, uh, just based on what I've heard, because I think what he wants to do is establish his lane um, and, you know, to just deter anybody else from thinking that they should be making those trips to Iowa or New Hampshire and trying to fundraise, talk to donors. Uh, Trump kind of wants to make clear from my perspective that this is his race. And so I would expect an announcement fairly soon because, I mean, basically, we've already seen him announce it uh, multiple times. He's in just from what he's told other people we know firsthand that he's made it pretty clear that he's going to run. Could he still decide not to run? Certainly. But when you're this clear in public um, about it over and over again, I think it, it's a pretty strong indication of what I think a lot of reporters are also hearing uh, in private that a, an announcement should be expected soon just to sort of clear the field in a way that might remind people of what happened with Hillary Clinton in 2016, um, when you had a pretty pretty obvious favorite who, who really tried to consolidate um, and consolidate power, consolidate support. Um, and I would expect maybe a few other candidates in the way that you had your Martin O'Malley's. I would, I would expect to see something like a Republican version of that going into 2024. I don't know if any Republican who's looking at 2024 wants to be compared to former Governor O'Malley's <laughs> 2016 campaign, with respect to Governor O'Malley, but it didn't turn out too for well. Sure. Chuck Rocha and Emily Jasinski, thank you very much to both of you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.